The rarest honey in the world is only found at high altitudes. Like this remote cliff in the Himalayas of Nepal. Honey hunters hang by a rope ladder to harvest these combs. One wrong move and the plunge is 800 feet. What's extracted is called mad honey because it can make you hallucinate. For centuries, an indigenous people, the Gurungs, have been the only ones to harvest it. It's a big part of their culture. And they believe it has healing properties too. But now the rest of the world has caught on. A 32-ounce bottle goes for $300 in the U.S. We followed Man Bahadur Gurung on the three-day-long honey hunting ritual to find out why this ancient tradition is still happening and what makes it such a risky business. The village of Sildunga sits about 6,000 feet above sea level. 64 families live here, and they're all involved in the hunt for honey. Everyone comes together the day before for the Maruni dance, which celebrates good over evil. The next day, Man, the village's main honey hunter, gets the handmade bamboo ladder ready. They keep essentials to the minimum, ropes, buckets and gear to protect against bee stings. They're heading to Tarebhir, a cliff where they've hunted for thousands of years. It's a three-hour drive. The village elder leads the commencement ritual. At the bottom of the cliff, they start a fire to smoke out the beads. <laughs> At the top, another group assembles the ladder. Then they tie it to a tree and slowly move it down the cliff. Man climbs down the ladder barefoot for the best grip. He's about 80 stories above ground. But for safety, Man ties himself to the ladder by a rope. That's his only harness. As the bees swarm around him, he puts his hands in his pocket to protect them from stings. He still remembers the time when he was attacked by bees three years ago. The stings are painful, and to avoid fainting, 
Mun rubs honey into his hands. But he's trading one risk for another because the honey makes his hands slippery. Still, it has been 30 years since a honey hunter died on the job. Man uses his 12-foot long stick called a tango to cut the honeycomb. Finally, he breaks off the comb. 800 feet below, a plastic sheet catches it. They collected eight combs, leaving behind 36 others. The next day, hunters head back to the village and start extracting the honey. Man says it's more abundant, stronger and sweeter in the spring. The smaller combs usually have the most, about 500 ounces. Locals celebrate the hunter's safe return in a tradition called shosho. It's meant to settle any nerves the men had during the hunt. These customs have been passed down for generations in Nepal, where people have been using this honey as a natural medicine since 1300 BC. They believe that it cures respiratory issues and that it works as an antiseptic and an aphrodisiac. <laughs> While scientists are still researching the effects of mad honey, global demand has exploded in recent years. And that has led to over-harvesting, with foreign groups coming in to hunt for their own honey in the Gurung's land. So the Gurungs found a solution to regain control. And there's a reason why it's home to the very uncommon mad honey. The largest honeybee species in the world, measuring up to 1.2 inches, lives here. The Apis laboriosa nests in altitudes ranging from 3,000 to 10,000 feet above sea level. And they feed on a specific type of rhododendron that has a neurotoxin in its nectar. That's what triggers hallucinations. But climate change is causing the flowers to bloom unpredictably. The bee population is also shrinking because of natural disasters like wildfires, heavier rainfall, and extreme temperature changes. This all means less honey. In 2022, the village harvested about four gallons of honey compared to about 40 gallons in 2017. Half of the honey is distributed evenly to every single villager. The rest goes to markets in Nepal. Other cliffs across the Himalayas and Turkey also have mad honey. And it sells online for hundreds of dollars. But this village makes only $1,800 on average every year from honey sales. So it's not really about the money. Most people here rely on farming for a steady income, like Man's father. <laughs> but he participates in all of the hunting traditions like every villager. Man began hunting in his early 40s, when the Gurungs believe a man is in the prime of his life. Before that, he worked construction jobs in Malaysia. 
In fact, 56% of Nepali families have at least one person working and living abroad because of the lack of jobs in the country. They send home more than $8 billion a year in remittances. Man's son is also a construction worker. But Man hopes he will come home soon to carry on the tradition of honey hunting.